Okay, so I'm not hearing back from you, but I think it's working. <clears throat> so thank you, everyone. Um, as you know, part of the inspiration for this talk is that we, you know, we have resources to study astrology today more than ever. You know, we have more schools, programs, people can study online. So much is available, made available for us, and we can choose our level of involvement, whether we want to, you know, just get the, <clears throat> the essential or we want to dive deeper into a program. So it's an exciting time for astrology in so many ways. And yet, it's another thing to be able to know astrology. You know, it's a, it's the first challenge is to really own our skills and to be able to really use the body of knowledge. And it's another thing to manage our practice and to be able to live sustainably from astrology. Up for, until recently, you know, most people waited for their retirement to be able to take on astrology more professionally. You know, they found that they could not practically support families just doing readings or, or practicing astrology. So now, you know, with the internet revolution and the fact that we are able to access so many more people beyond the scope of our immediate location environment, um, we've been able, many of us, uh, to be successful, at least to support ourselves and our families. And more and more, we see people now making that leap to become an astrologer as a first profession, you know, out of high school or out of uh, at least um, college. So you, as, as we expand and as we become better and as we have more resources, it also becomes very interest, important to um, I would say, learn, you know, wear all those different hats. As astrologers, we are not only reading charts, but we are also networking. Um, many of us become graphic designers because we have to put these slides together. You know, we, we will do public speaking and we have to present well. Um, so we learn about marketing. We learn about... Uh, graphic design, we learn about accounting, so many different uh, things to do. And many times the astrologer, again, because of financial reason, it takes a while until we're really able to delegate and hire professionals to do those extra tasks. So I hope this is inspiring and that will give you some insights into um, basically how to be successful, you know, how to, oops, sorry, how to make the best of your practice and do something you love. One of the things I will say from an astrology and astrologer point of view, there's something about the profession of astrology that is not only inspiring because we love to do it, but it's also you know, it's a profession that gives us a lot of freedom. We can work, you know, and design our own schedules. We can work from home. Um, we can travel. We meet many people who are also seekers. You know, how many have that privilege to have as clients people who ask deep questions about their lives and be able overall to work with people who are on a spiritual journey, who are at least, um, you know, asking those questions. So it's really a privilege to be able to 
have those perks, so to speak. So not just do something you love, but work with people who are, you know, on your um that's on your level, I would say, on your level of interest, and people who are also your friends sometimes. So I'm really, you know, I'm I feel really blessed to be able to lead my life and be an astrologer, do something that is very meaningful for my life, but also very meaningful for others, being able to make a difference in this world in such a way. And I hope uh, many of you have that opportunity as well. So let's get started. <clears throat> um, you know, 12, 12 steps, 12 commandments, 12 suggestions, whatever, you know, we call them, uh, we're definitely understanding that each sign represents an important milestone. And I will say for me, because a lot of what I'm sharing today is my own experience, of course, um, one of the things that really got my practice going is that from early on, I was out of the closet, which means everyone knew that I was practicing astrology, I was not hiding it. And we can understand why some people will feel that they have to be more discreet about it. Sometimes there can be seriously hostile environments that people may, you know, may be raised in very conservative families, whether it's there's a religious bias against astrology or whether you know, there's a lot of academic scientific bias against astrology. You know, we know that what unites astrology, excuse me, what unites science and religion is astrology because they both hate us. <laughs> so it's not an easy thing to really, you know, say that you are practicing astrology and that's what you do or studying it um how many of us know and have experienced that when you say it out loud people start gazing elsewhere and you know the conversation ends right when you tell them that or more often you know they when you say you're practicing astrology they'll they'll tell you they'll ask you about how massive your telescope is and um, what observatory you're working at. So they confuse astrology with astronomy because in their mind, you know, who in their right mind would be an astrologer? And of course, it's astronomy. So it's, you know, I've had so many awkward, funny uh, encounters like that where people went on and on to tell me how they admire astronomy. And then the moment I clarified that I was doing astrology, they became silent, you know, like the conversation ended. What I'm saying is that it takes that ability to overcome the fear of criticism, the fear of prejudice, and sometimes the fear of serious opposition. I have a friend who is a very successful astrologer and you know he came home one one day in his earlier earlier years of practicing and his family ganged up on him with a priest and they started to hold him down and perform an exorcism on him so it can get really weird and sometimes like I said, hostile. And yet, just like everything else in life, the moment you let it out, the moment you feel confident enough, that's when things start to move, circulate the energy. I remember that saying to everyone that I was practicing astrology, I definitely lost some friends. And on the other hand, that's how I gain clients, because surprisingly, 
some people um, wanted to know more, you know, those I least expected from. You know, sometimes you think um, people won't understand you, but you may be mistaken that there are more allies than you may think. And so people started to ask me for readings. You know, I didn't even advertise yet. I was just in my preliminary, you know, development of my practice. And I remember how one thing led to another, like one person came and then they suggested their friends and then their friends, you know, this word of mouth started to really circulate. And, you know, at back in the days, 30 years ago or so, you know, we didn't have the internet, we couldn't advertise freely online. And, and so the word of mouth was really um, very important. But beyond the practicalities, when you get out of the closet and when you affirm yourself as an astrologer, there's something energetic that opens your floodgates. You know, people start to respond to your confidence. If you're hiding, people feel the fear. Just like, you know, in the animal kingdom, the most dangerous thing is to show fear because if you show fear, you will be um, vulnerable and, and aggressed even. So if people won't be attracted to fear, if they sense that you are not confident and that you, you, you know, you're hiding, who's going to want to sign up as, a, as your client? And I'm not just talking about those who know you. I'm talking even energetically, you know, what you are shining, what you're beaming. So with all that it entails, getting out of the closet is a very important business move because you have to shine your light to the world. And yes, you will lose some friends, probably. And so it, may, so it is, you know, accept that. So birth yourself, you know, uh, as a fire Aries force, be who you are. Don't try to be someone else. Don't hide behind labels. You know, sometimes people define themselves as um, practitioners, consultants and whatnot, you know, even for tax reasons. I will say, honestly, you know, I immigrated to the United States and I said on my application that I was an astrologer and the government gave me a working permit and then gave me a green card and then gave me a citizenship. So if you are confident, nobody's going to harass you. They will, they will learn to honor you. The other thing that's important in this is that you will also realize that if you are educated, if you are, if you have a PhD, you know, and all your friends are VIPs and, and esteemed people of society, that's how we can advance astrology. Because if all the educated people are hiding their astrology, then how will astrology ever be taken seriously? We need you know, smart people, uh, well-adjusted people, um, respected members of society to wear the astrology badge. And that's how people are going to start thinking that um, mm, maybe there's something to it. Maybe I am prejudiced. If that person that I'm respecting is practicing astrology, maybe it's not as silly as I thought it was. I know, and every movement that started in, on the fringes initially was misunderstood until people, you know, were confident enough to let it out. 
So take that seriously. <clears throat> the Torah side, you know, spirit and matter. We are obviously, as astrologer, you know, diving, exploring star knowledge, exploring the mysteries of life. So whether you are, you know, a very technical astrologer or even, you know, an astrologer who's all about, you know, financial matters and practical things, we're still connecting heaven and earth because we're bringing those planetary cycle in the context of um, everyday life. There, you know, we're we're living in a in a era. I won't say a time because it's it's thousands of years now. At least during this whole Pisces age, where more and more there's a separation between spirit and matter. And what I see basically um, is, is some people are very self-conscious about associating financial gain with a spiritual practice. There's some self-consciousness, awkwardness, sometimes shame about charging money. And I feel that um, this is doing disservice because astrology will benefit from people investing in it financially. If astrologers do well financially, you know, they will do more research. They will build better schools. They will write better books. It's going to only enhance our field. So money is not dirty. Money is energy. Um, of course, we shouldn't abuse it, we shouldn't exploit people, we shouldn't be greedy, it's all about balance, but in and of itself, there is that need to understand sustainability, and not become, you know, too precious to uh, understand the financial imperatives. You know, Stormy covered that, I, I suspect. And um, that definitely is a very important step in our successful development. And to me, it's important not only to survive, not only to live from hand to mouth and to, you know, struggle every month to pay the bill, but to thrive. Because as self-employed people, who you know don't have the security of um, a guaranteed salary every month and not having the security of having an employer who's going to cover for our health insurance and all the perks that come with being employed, we need to be extremely creative. We need to be strong. And we need some security to be able to save, to be able to also have some spare time to do research and to take care of ourselves, of our families. So, you know, we, the, the mindset needs to change that abundance is not selfish. Making it financially is going to help feed astrology in return you know the better you're doing the more you can be generous the better you're doing the higher the quality of your product so you deserve it you know just come with that place of making peace with money and yes you know be accessible offer uh, financial aid, if you have programs that may be more expensive than others. You know, there are many ways to, um, to charge appropriately and to remain accessible for those who, are, who have sincere needs. You know, I, I will say sincere needs because we have to understand that sometimes it's all a matter of value. 
um, people will, you know, will pay a thousand dollars for an airline ticket to Europe and they'll pay for it, but then they don't, they won't, you know, they will hesitate paying $150 to, for a reading. And so what's happening here is that they see that astrology may not be worth the investment. Uh, and so what we need to convey is that it is valuable you know that a reading will change their lives possibly and that an astrology education will be very um, life-changing so if we understand that a reading can really be for some a really valuable effective therapy it's worth the investment so, you know, get better at what you do so that you can charge better, you know, and you can sustain yourself financially, you know, be, excel at what you do so that you provide the service that is of high quality and um, you can be remunerated accordingly. So the other thing, uh, we need to uh, consider here is that when when we invest in astrology, we also bring astrology to the mainstream. One of the struggles I've seen is that because people feel like they cannot make a living from astrology, they won't invest in an education. You know, you're, go you're, you're going to invest thousands of dollars to become an electrician, to become a nurse, to become whatever profession is out there, because you know that this will give you a job and this will give you um, some security. So you know that even though it costs a thousands of dollars, you'll be able to get a return from that and get a profession. But if you're not confident that astrology is a viable and sustainable profession, why are you going to invest thousands of dollars in an education? Of course, then it's a luxury, it's a hobby. And you know, you won't spend thousands of dollars on an education if you can't get some return from it. So, things to think about. <clears throat> Diversify your services. So from a Gemini point of view, you know, create different sources of income. Um, most astrologers who are lead leaders in the field you know, will usually perform readings one-on-one. -on -one, and then some of them will teach classes. Some of them will be public speakers, write articles. So it's very useful to work through different formats. I think for me personally, it's also what makes it more interesting. So it's not just a practical choice, but it's also the way I'm wired. I like to shift from one-on-one -on -one readings to working with groups of, you know, 15, 20 people. And then working, you know, teaching at conferences for dozens and hundreds of people. So you kind of change formats. And you have this way and ability to network differently, to share the knowledge differently, and to also, you know, e each platform has a different dynamic, brings out something different out of you. You know, what happened in a very intimate reading where there's so much vulnerability, 
it's going to be different from what happens in the larger group. And yet, <clears throat> they both are valuable. But importantly, you know, diversifying your services also means that if you are, get tired of doing readings, uh, no, you, can, you can supplement income from, from teaching. And then think about the fact that one hour, if you're teaching, you know, dozens of people, one hour of teaching will also bring uh, more income for the time that you're investing. So diversifying your services is going to be both practical and more stimulating. Um, understand, you know, from a cancer point of view that when we practice astrology, and again, it, even if you're doing more technical stuff, even if you're involved with more research and, and not working as closely with people still, you know, astrology is like an x-ray. And we are able to look at very, very deep themes, qualities, and vulnerabilities. So for most of us, especially if you're doing readings, uh, for most of us, we really touch on people's personal stories you know, how unique they are, how the chart brings out those different qualities. Where are the wounds? And so more often than not, there are some stories, you know, we, we hear the, about people's personal journeys and it's, it's being able to hold the space. It's being able to really be, um, to provide a safe space and to have the patience. You know, if you don't have the patience to hear people's difficulties, you know, this is not a profession for you. So, um, you know, that's where the water in our chart becomes very helpful is to connect, you know, in a place where people can unpack and the you know the key word here is vulnerability so um it takes it takes some training you know not all astrologers know how to do that well i know so many good astrologers who can read charts very accurately who have really flawed consulting skills so how many times I've heard, you know, well, I saw that in the chart, so I had to tell the truth. You know, they, you know, the, the relationship's going to fail. You know, the chances of success are really slim. And so, yeah, maybe the chart does suggest that a breakup is coming up, but we're dealing with people. We're dealing with vulnerable people, and we're not just here to prove that we know. We're not just here to show off how smart we are. We're here to help people. So if you need to care about people in order to be in this profession, because astrology is very powerful, it can both help and it can destroy. It can be a tool that ends up wounding others. Now, this is true not only for clients, it's also true with your colleagues, you know, with people you're working with. It doesn't matter how seasoned we are. You know, I often see when doing the OPA peer group, where we meet with colleagues and often seasoned astrologers, how insecure some of these very well-known astrologers are. So, you know, that, that's part of that human quality. 
that cancer is about. <clears throat> Moving on to Leo. You know, Leo is about really taking the stage. And, you know, there's this misconception about Leo as quite often with astrologers that every time you ask, you know, what is Leo about? Oh, Leo like compliments. You know, it's as if Leos are these most super superficial beings who thrive on praise and the, everything they do is for praise. I mean, Leo is the sign of the heart and it's the sign of, the cre of creativity. So let's dig a little deeper and understand that to perform, to actually be on stage, to actually decide that you are going to be an astrologer, you know, it's, it's an immense service because if you're not doing it, who will? If you're not taking the stage, the stage may be empty. The same thing, you know, uh, we look with politics. If, if no one's running, how many times, you know, we have lousy leaders staying in power because no one else shows up. And so Leo is about that. It's about rising, just like the sun rises every morning and showing up for your calling. You have a calling. If you're an astrologer, it's a lot of work and it, it requires a great deal of creativity. And it's about you know being there and teaching your workshops because if you're not teaching it, who will? If you're not there to provide the service, the chair remains empty. The service is not delivered. And especially in our times, you know, where astrology is still, you know, not mainstream, we need people who take it seriously, who are going to be dedicated, who are going to take the risks of, you know, going for it. So, you know, invest the energy. Uh, it takes a lot of training, effort, practice uh, to lead your life, to lead your practice. And that's what Leo's about. One of the things also, you know, I wrote about Aries. One of the um, other notes I, I, I wrote, no plan B. And that's one way also to succeed as an astrologer. And if you hear that calling, if you feel that, you know, it checks the boxes for you. One of the ways to succeed in any profession that has an element of risk is that you understand that it's not a practical choice. You know, you're not, some people say, you know, oh, you're an astrologer, you probably make a lot of money because people have so many problems and they like to, you know, get reassurance from people like you. But do you believe in astrology? So they, they actually think that I'm doing astrology because it's a good money maker, uh, but I don't really believe in it. I'm just doing it to, to make a lot of money. You know, it, it's it's that twisted kind of way of looking at life that, you know, you're not coming from the heart, that you're, you're doing something because there's an immediate gain there. So <clears throat> that, uh, you know, that place of coming from the heart also means that you will make it work even if you face obstacles. You know, if you can't pay your rent, be more creative. I found myself so many times in places where I was struggling. I didn't have enough clients. And so what to do, you know, should I just wait and see? No, 
I'm going to take a proactive approach. I'm going to advertise better. Maybe I'm going to make a new class that's going to be more interesting. You know, I have to question how to get people's attention. And, and from a leader point of view, to know that what you are offering is great. It's valuable. It's powerful. It's worth it. Believe in it. Love yourself and love what you do. The rest will follow. But as I said earlier, you know, it's one thing to love astrology. It's another thing to show up. And it's a third thing to actually do good work. So part of really being successful is to keep polishing yourself, polish that diamond, you know, that raw resource, make it so valuable, so impactful, improve your skills, whether you, you know, you study from mentors or whether you learn from experience or do your research, your service needs to be impeccable. And I mean that at least in your eyes, but also make sure that what happens in the life of the people you're working with is impactful. You know, how many of us do readings and then we don't know if the reading was really helpful? I mean, we can have a good feeling about it and sense that it was impactful, but with astrologers, we don't always have a feedback mechanism. If it's a one-time reading, you know, and not a series of sessions. So it's it's useful, you know, to, to really invest more time and see, are you really helping people? Are you really making a difference? Is this really um, useful? Or, you know, are you just sharing, you know, insights that are okay and um, when people, you know, get out of it without depth or without really something that was effective for them. So ask yourself those critic, self-critical questions. You know, critical thinking may not be comfortable. It may not be something that um, we like to do, but there's a reason why we keep improving. Self-improvement is about honesty and it's about effort and willingness. So do the hard work. Okay, different points of view. Libra represents opposites, represents alliances. We know that there are many approaches to a chart reading. We know that, you know, people debate about how systems and modern versus traditional approaches or all types of astrology. Um, the bottom line that we, we do need to remember is that no one owns the truth. You know, we're all having glimpses. We're all touching on something. And it seems so relevant, so valuable that we forget, you know, we think it's, it's everything. So Libra is definitely about listening. And you're not just listening to your client, you're also listening to your colleagues, listening to your competitors, whoever you call them. <clears throat> I know that I learn so much when I ask questions. So in a reading, I'm not just lecturing. I need to see how things are actually showing up in my clients' lives. I need to see that 
I'm not, you know, just making up stories. So <clears throat> listening can also mean you need to adjust yourself. That something you thought you saw in the chart, you know, I can see that you had struggles with your parents and they will say, mm, I don't think so. You know, my parents were great. We get, we always got along very well. So, hmm. Don't project, you know, uh, your knowledge as if you're, don't be absolute with your statements. So accepting diversity of approaches, accepting differences, sometimes things that are very, very different from you. Um, just be open-minded and learn from each other. And it's totally fine that, you know, you may not want to be a modern astrologer, that this is not your cup of tea, but it's important to respect those people who are not like you, who are seeing it differently. The same way we ask people to respect us as astrologers. And this continues into the Scorpio experience. You know, Scorpio is again, hard truths. <clears throat> Test what you know in real time. And don't be afraid to be wrong. You know, expose your own vulnerabilities, your own insecurities, your own blind spots, shed light where you have the most fear. So the Scorpio work is not only helping our clients do shadow work and, you know, touching on those super vulnerable tender spots and providing a safe space for them to hopefully heal. But it also is the shadow work that we need to do where we are missing a point or we are out of line or we are basically um, missing something. So that, that Scorpio thing is about really testing your knowledge and not being afraid to be wrong because it's an opportunity to learn. It's, it's humbling, you know, Scorpio energy and Scorpio experiences are humbling by nature because Scorpio reminds you that you're not invincible, that you, you haven't conquered it all, you know, that you have wounds and, and fears and insecurities and so on. So that's, you know, an important uh, experience takes a lot of courage to do that kind of check. And I think, again, if we speak about OPA, I think that the peer group work where seasoned astrologers suddenly find themselves in a very vulnerable place where they share their vulnerabilities. You know, it's very much part of that Scorpionic experience. Because in our practice, you know, we are the teachers and the masters and the, the consultants and we are in a position of authority of power so the peer group is an opportunity to suddenly question ourselves to suddenly um you know maybe fail maybe not have such great readings and and someone's going to be there and see us when we have our pants down so there's that, there's that sense that even those who are successful and, and well-known or on top of their game in one way or another need to do that kind of inner check, checks and balances, and have the courage to expose those vulnerabilities with others.
Of course, this takes us again to working with people who are themselves in that position of vulnerability. You know, how many of us have clients who are very successful in their lives, but when they come to us, you know, they can unpack, they can share their fears. So holding that space. Education. You know, I, I mentioned earlier how astrology today more than ever is accessible to all of us. We have better schools. We have more schools. And, you know, when we ask people, how, how did you become an astrologer? What was your path and, and your milestones? And so many astrologers will say that they are self-taught. And this was the way for many of us, because at, at the time, there weren't that many schools. And, you know, your way to study was through the books and through um, conferences, perhaps, and kind of piecing things together, patching up those uh, different influences. But today we have the privilege to have more rigorous programs, whether you want an academic degree, you know, uh, study in England at the Bath University, or whether you want a more um, therapeutic, soul-oriented workshop um, uh, education, or whether you want to learn the the technique, the, te the techniques and the predictive approaches, or whether you want it all. My my sincere belief is that. In order to really be a good astrologer, today you need three steps of study. The first one is the with, you know, expose yourself. See what's out there. Learn from online courses. Read those books. Expand your knowledge. Meet the different mentors. And it's so expose yourself to the diversity. But then at some point you need depth. You need a mentor who takes you from A to Z and provides you with a feedback mechanism, a level of rigor, testing, practice that you cannot find in conferences, you cannot find in weekend workshops, and you cannot find without a real commitment. More than ever, because today, you know, we, astrology is expanding and we're reaching more and more people. And as great as that is, it also means there's more and more risk. And if unqualified astrologers become more and more visible, it's going to take our profession down because there's going to be a scandal, there's going to be a lawsuit, there's going to be malpractice of one sort or another. It's round the corner. So make sure that you have that level of training where you're not just learning quali you know, uh, quality astrology, but you're also learning about consulting skills, ethical behavior, um, and the things we're talking about here, you know, all those additional things that help you um, be successful in your practice. And then, you know, once you graduate and you do have a piece of paper, a diploma, it's important. It's not just for your confidence. It's important that someone actually tests you and gives you a seal of approval and says, you know, you can read a chart. I can attest to that. It's important. So once you cover that second step, you, you need to start practicing. So many of us feel like, oh, I need another class and I need another training. And, you know, we become eternal students and we're afraid to really jump in the water. 
So the third step is that there are things that you cannot learn from mentors, you cannot learn from books, that you will only learn from direct experience with clients. That's when everything has to come together and theory becomes reality. So there's a point where you need to stop attending classes or at least take a break and you need to just work. And your learning will be from being out in the world and getting feedback. Tenth house, you know, Capricorn using the power of astrology wisely and doing astrology justice. So we have to remind ourselves and pinch ourselves that, wow, we're doing something so important for humanity. We are the vessels, you know, we are the messengers. We are the modern priests who translate, you know, celestial knowledge into human language. It's a privilege. That's something I, I say often to students. You know, you're in this classroom, and it may be great and fun, but this knowledge that is provided to you, make sure that you value this opportunity. Make sure that you're not taking it for granted that just because you paid for it, you know, you can do whatever you want with it. There's a level of responsibility and commitment. And it's a privilege that you need to acknowledge that you have access to this sacred divine knowledge. So it's doing astrology justice means that you, you represent astrology in this world. You are carrying the torch and you become the authority in the field. So, you know, it, it goes without saying that you should not use astrology uh, to take advantage of people, um, to deceive and whatever malvolent intention may be, because <clears throat> the karma <laughs> that you are going to accrue from doing that is, is going to be considerable. The same way that, you know, if a business person cheats is one thing, but if a priest cheats, it's more grave, you know, it's more, uh, it, it's a heavier weight because you are holding a position that really puts you in a, in a place where people trust you and where you're, you're involved with something that has sacred value. So using that without <clears throat> the right intention, without appreciating what you're doing um, is, is really not, you know, it, it's kind of an affront, an ethical and spiritual affront. So um, recognize the responsibility to serve as an astrologer and to have access to this incredible, body of knowledge. Now, <clears throat> Aquarius always refers to, you know, what are we bringing into the future? How are we developing ourselves? And so as astrologer, we are constantly the bridge between 
the ancestors, those who came before us, who built everything that we now stand on. You know, that, that famous phrase of standing on the shoulder of giants and being able to stand taller, brighter, and more, have more impact because you rely on your ancestors. So that work of really honoring your line, honoring and receiving help and guidance from your ancestors, but at the same time, understanding how we're, our brain keep, keeps evolving, how we're making new connections, how new perspectives are constantly being revealed and how we need to adapt to our times and how everything is accelerating as we move into the future. Part of the Aquarian paradigm is not only elevation, but it's also acceleration. So we're not just standing taller and we're not just reaching new heights and discovering new planets and finding more out more about the universe. And this informs us about daily life, you know, about taking care of our bodies and, and managing our resources. <clears throat> so that kind of relationship and negotiation between the past and the future is is equally important. And there's always a fear that as we move into the future, we lose, we lose the past. You know, how many of us say, oh, you know, today's generation, the kids, they're not valuing human connections because they're so much into their screens and phones. And they, there's always that nostalgia about, you know, the way we used to do things. Um, and yet, there is a way to find that perfect balance between the respect of what came before, the learning of sometimes lost knowledge from the past, and how to take it to the next step, how to take it to, how to evolve it, how to be open-minded and reconfigure how to develop our astrology civilization. So, moving to our last phase, through Pisces, you know, we know and know and know and know, and then we realize we don't know. The more you learn, the more mysteries reveal themselves you know the infinite the infinity of space and i'm so obviously amazed by the web telescope who is now sending us amazing photograph of deeper and deeper corners of the universe with such high resolution and you know it makes us feel so so small and that's what pisces is about is to realize that there's a lot that's not in the chart. As much as we know, you know, a chart cannot tell us the gender, the sex of the person. A chart doesn't tell us the race. A chart doesn't even tell us if it's a person or an event. A chart is just energy of the moment. It's a measure of time. So, <clears throat> As, as much as astrology opens our mind and provides this X-ray vision into the psyche, into the mysteries of life, it also doesn't reveal everything. And for good reasons. Astrology only works in context. Context of the time, context of the culture, context of what's happening in real life. And so from a Pisces point of view is, is to be able to understand that there's that missing ingredient that we have to trust. That sometimes, you know, <clears throat> a daunting Mars-Pluto transit 
that looks so intense and so confrontational can actually be a delightful experience, can actually be something we, you know, we have a, the best day of our lives during that transit. And, and so astrology and life keep surprising us. Our formulas have to meet this mystery that keeps telling us that there's more to know. And there are some things we will never know. And it's about accepting, humbly accepting that there's a higher intelligence and we need to trust it. We are part of a sum of it all. There are so many factors that we cannot compute. <clears throat> and so that's the secret ingredient. How do we get there when we stop over analyzing? And one thing I will say, you know, to close on this is that I find myself that with all the experience I have, that when I look at a chart, I often blank. I don't know what I'm going to tell this person. Yes, I see their houses and aspects, but I, I come up with some insights. But then when I actually meet the person, whether it's on the phone, or whether it's in Zoom, or whether it's in person, that's when the missing ingredient comes in. That's when something clicks that suddenly gives life to the chart, just energetically. And that's why I often feel like it's not worth over-preparing because I don't end up reading my notes. What happens in that synergy, using astrology, relying on my knowledge, but trusting that moment where the exchange is flowing is what makes a successful reading. So, um, this completes our 12 steps. That was beautiful, um, Maurice. Thank you I so hope much. I know I hope it inspires you and uh, I'm just going to plug in quickly this slide that just creeped in and this is a workshop I'm going to be teaching uh, next week online astrology of relationships so here I'm giving you an example of how to keep your practice sustainable don't be afraid to advertise yourself not because you want to brag but because you know you're offering something valuable and people should know about it. Thank, Thank you, you so again. much, Maurice. And they can go to mauricefernandez.com to find out more information about your work and your up and coming workshop. And um, this was just wonderful. I love the way that you gave all of us so much support and uh, going forward with um, presenting ourselves as astrologers and also the ethical standards part that was just phenomenal. So thank you, Maurice. Thank you, Carol, and all the best to everyone.